And here we go. We are live and welcome everyone. We have a very good conversation today on polyploid breeding. As you see on your screen, we're talking to Max Jones from the University of Guelph. And uh, I'm just gonna let him run and he's, he's gonna introduce himself and move on from there to a presentation. And uh, this is gonna be really fun and we're all gonna learn a lot today. Is this, the subject has, has kept popping up in the previous shows and it'll probably continue on after this show is over. So we're, we're really glad that Max is here to share it with us. So uh, can you tell the people a little bit about yourself and your background and what we're here to talk about today? Yeah, great. First of all, thanks for the in in invitation. I'm happy to be here. My name is Max Jones. Um, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Plant Agriculture at the University of Guelph uh, in Canada. I, most of my research is focused on plant tissue culture and micropropagation. Um, but we have started working quite a bit in kind of uh, pre-breeding and breeding technologies, including polyploid um, technologies, which I'm going to be talking about today. All right. It's a micropropagation. That's another thing that was, uh, uh, there were several shows about that earlier today. Is it, uh, can you talk a little bit about that before we get into the main, main subject? It's like, is, what's your most, what are you most fascinated with that? Where, where are you, where's your passion? Well, so we, we've had a license since about 2018, but I've been working with it since about 2016. So we've uh, been doing quite a bit. Um, I find it really interesting because it's, you know, when I first started working with it, uh, there was very little information on it. So there was a lot of um, really basic research questions to ask. Now we're starting to get into what I think is a little bit more fun, I guess, and that's things like uh, inducing polyploids, cryopreservation, um, more of the advanced biotechnology um, of, of that nature. So, you know, it's been a fun ride so far and looking forward to um, continuing. All right. Right on, right on. So uh, tell, can you tell people what polyploids are before a little bit before you get into your presentation? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of slides on it, so um, okay. I, I think it'll probably be more effective to, to use the slides. Um, okay. Yeah, that's yeah, good. if you don't mind. Sorry. No, not at all. This is, that's why you did the slideshow. Yeah, exactly. And so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I did prepare some slides, probably too many slides, but um, hopefully not. And so we're going to be talking about polyploid breeding in cannabis, and that's a formatting error. It's not polyploid breeding in cannabis, um, but you could say it that way if you want. Um, so without further ado, I, I, I do want to add this slide. This is just full disclosure that uh, one of my students has started a spinoff company that I'm involved with. Um, this is Remix Genetics, and we're offering contract polyploid services. So, you know, if you're interested in polyploidy and you want to um, discuss some collaborative projects um, to create tetraploids or triploids or anything like that, uh, reach out to us. We also have some genetic sales and licensing. Um, you know, this isn't just a shameless advertisement. I, I just wanted to um, highlight the potential conflict um, before I get going. So um, just wanted to put that out there. Um, also, a public service announcement before we get going. These are not signs of triploidy. And you know, if, if you read across the internet, you're going to see all sorts of things. People referring to um, this guy with uh, three cotyledons and three little leaflets here as a, a tetraploid. That is not a sign of, uh, or, or as a triploid, sorry. That's not a sign of polyploidy at all. That's just a different mutation. We have had some tetraploids and, and triploids that had this, but um, it's, it's uh, not the same thing. Same with this, this faciated um, cannabis here. This is not a polyploid. Or, well, it could be, but this is not a sign of polyploidy. So that's my public service announcement because there's a lot of confusion about polyploids in general. And this is one of the most common ones out there. So what is polyploidy? So um, now I'll get to this. And, you know, the, the, uh, uh, just a standard definition would be the heritable condition of possessing more than two complete sets of chromosomes. And so I think everyone here is familiar that all of us have two sets of chromosomes. You get one from your mother, you get one from your father, and then you have um, two versions of each gene, right? Um, in the case of tetraploids or, or polyploids, they have more than two. So this is pretty rare in mammals, which is why a lot of people aren't that familiar with it. Um, but it's quite common in plants. And so it occurs naturally. This is a very um, common thing in plant evolution. And that, it's actually one of the major drivers of speciation. So when new species evolve in the plant world, polyploidization is often um, part of it. As a side note, um, it's also common in some fish and some amphibians. So it's not that no animals do this. It's just that it's and even some mammals, I believe, do this, but it's not common, I would say. So that's the technical definition of what it is. But, you know, I also wanted to go over some terms because I'm going to be throwing them around. So I, I want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, and so this is kind of the, um, the, the level. Can you guys see my pointer when I do this? Or no? I cannot. 
Okay, good to know. Um, yeah. So from top to bottom, um, we start with the haploid, and this is um, what you would find in a sperm or an egg or a pollen in an egg cell. Um, and this would typically have one copy of each chromosome and gene. Um, and so you don't find many organisms that live as a haploid for a very long period. Um, that's not entirely true, but um, for the sake of this, we'll, we'll say that um, in the higher plants anyway. Um, diploids has two sets, so that's what we are. We're, we're a diploid organism. Um, and then we get into the polyploids, so triploid, tetraploid, all the way up to octoploid, these would all be polyploids. So when I say polyploid, I could be referring to any of these, I could re be referring to all of them. And then if I say triploid, that's a specific type of polyploid, right? And so the, the, the diagram on the right is just kind of visually showing what that is, showing a haploid, diploid, triploid, and tetraploid, right? Um, so just in some important terms to, to get out of the way. So some examples of polyploid in plants. Um, I know that the, I was watching some of the earlier talks too, and they, they, gave, they gave away some of my secrets here, but um, some of the examples of polyploids in plants that you'd be familiar with would be banana, which is a triploid, um, potatoes, which tend to be tetraploid, but there are diploids and um, all the way up to, either, I believe, pentaploids and things like that. Um, common wheat is a hexaploid, so it has six copies of each gene. And then strawberry is an octaploid, and so it has eight copies of each gene. Right. And so there's a lot of other plants that do this, but these are just common ones that I, I thought were good examples. Another side note, um, and this is uh, when I was a master's student, my, my professor gave me a recipe for polyploid punch. And so now I'm passing on the wisdom. I, I did have to recreate it a bit, but um, basically this is, a, you know, you take some vodka, which is made from potatoes, which would be a tetraploid. Mix that with some seedless watermelon, has to be seedless to make sure it's a triploid. Um, the, the juice of two seedless limes, which are also triploids, and then some sliced strawberries, which are octoploids, and then some cane sugar, um, which are also octoploids. And so this is just a, a, you know, a refreshing drink that you can, um, you can modify it to taste, but um, all made from polyploids. So good stuff. So anyway, polyploids, like I said, there, there are a lot of examples of polyploids, as we've, we've seen some so far. Um, but what's really interesting about this from my perspective is that um, it appears that during domestication, humans have actually been selecting for polyploids. And so this study um, from 2016, it's quite interesting. They went out and surveyed a bunch of wild plants and a bunch of domesticated plants from the same families and stuff like that. And what they found is from the plants they surveyed, 24% of the wild plants were tetra or polyploid, whereas 30% of domesticated crops were polyploid. Um, and so what this really shows is that, um, you know, we like polyploids and we like to domesticate and eat and use polyploids, um, but it's not evenly distributed. So if you look at this um, figure on the right here, um, the blue is showing the percentage of the plants that would be polyploid and the red is showing the percentage of the plants that are diploid. I don't know how clearly you can see this slide. So um, the top one here, you can see roots and tubers tend to be polyploid or almost the majority of them are polyploid. As you move down all the way to pulses, they're pretty much all diploid, right? And so it really depends on the type of crop you're looking at, how common tetraploidy or polyploidy would be, right? And so the question is why? And, uh, you know, it's, it's really that, you know, it really depends on what you're using the plant for and if the traits of polyploidy contribute to that use, right? Oh, sorry, I'm trying to change my slides with my arrows. So, um, so why do we like polyploid crops? And, you know, when we look at what polyploidism does to plants, you'll see that there's a lot of traits that we probably would say are probably good for agriculture. So, you know, when we look at the potential positive effects, um, you know, we, we see enlarged organs. So we see bigger leaves, flowers, tubers. Um, I highlighted flowers here because that's kind of pertinent to cannabis producers. Um, increased or altered secondary metabolite production. And so again, that's something that we're very interested in as cannabis producers. Uh, reduced internode length. Um, sometimes that happens. Um, sometimes we see increased abiotic stress tolerance. And, you know, I'm going to say right now, we, we don't know if we see that with cannabis yet. Um, but in some species, we see they're, they're more tolerant of drought or um, various abiotic stresses, so salinities, drought, things like that. Um, we see extreme phenotypes, which is really useful for selection. And so basically what this means is if you make a cross between two diploids, you would see a certain amount of variation. Whereas if you start making crosses between tetraploids, you see a much broader range of phenotypes. And so um, these extreme phenotypes can be, you know, most of them probably aren't that good, um, but some of them are really useful. And so we can select those and continue the domestication process. Um, then the last two here, uh, increased allelic diversity and potential increased heterosis, we'll come back to because uh, it needs a little bit of explanation. And then finally, um, seedlessness at odd ploidy levels. And we'll come back to this one as well. But, you know, seedlessness is one of the, the, the key drivers or factors that make cannabis producers interested in um, polyploidy, I would say. Although I, I hope to burst that bubble and show that there's other reasons to be interested during this talk. 
So some examples of polyploidy, other than my polyploid punch. Um, this is just an example from Arabidopsis. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Arabidopsis in general, but it's, it's, it's just a, a little scrubby weed, but it's a really good example for this. Um, and what we see here is we have the diploid, the tetraploid, and the octoploid. And you can see as the ploidy increases, the flower gets a lot bigger, um, which is one of the things that we said happens. Um, but what I think was really important about this paper, or really interesting about this paper, is down on the bottom panel B, you can see the diploid um, trichome in Arabidopsis. They have these funny little branch trichomes like this. Um, but what you can see as you increase ploidy level is the branching changes. And so I'm not saying that we're going to get branch trichomes in cannabis, which would be really awesome if we did. Um, but the important point here is that it affects trichome morphology. And so that's a really um, important factor for cannabis for very obvious reasons. Um, some of the other things that we see, um, and they, they report in this paper, is that we see larger cells. Um, we see fewer and larger stomates. And so these are the, the, um, the pores in the leaf that facilitate gas exchange. And so, you know, if you have fewer larger ones, that's obviously going to affect your water relations um, in the plant, for better or worse, I don't know. Um, we see wider leaves, um, larger flowers, and altered chemistry. So those are some of the things they saw. Um, another common thing is fruit size. And so on, the, on this slide, we're looking at on the top, we have grapes. And you can see the tetraploids are much larger than the diploids on the left. Um, on the bottom left is mulberry. And you can see, again, in both cases, the diploid is the small one and the tetraploid is the large one. And finally, the, the, the strawberry. And I know this came up in one of the other um, discussions. And basically, you can see the diploid and the octoploid are vastly different sizes. Um, in the case of strawberry, this has they're, they're, it's a little more complex than just ploidy, but um, but you can see that uh, the octoploid is much bigger. Um, this is just a slide showing hops. I, I just threw this one in because hops is related to cannabis, so you know it, it's kind of good to see what happened in that. And basically, what we see in this case is that the the, the florets don't really look much different, um, but the cone and the leaves are, are significantly different. So, you know, just another example. And then finally, I, th I think this is the last example I have um, because we don't want to stand here and look at all the tetraploids people have been making. But um, this one's from chrysanthemum. And this one's kind of interesting because you can see um, in this panel, you can see all the things we've talked about. So, you know, in, in A and E, you can see that's just the chromosome count. So they did some histology and you can see that um, A is the diploid, E is the tetraploid, and it has twice as many um, chromosomes. In B and F, you can see the stomates. So the diploid, you can see many smaller stomates. In the tetraploid, you can see fewer larger stomates. Um, C and G are the pollen. Um, in this case, they don't look that much different to me. Um, and then on the bottom left, you can see the flower, a much, much larger flower, um, actually an inflorescence, kind of similar to cannabis in a way, um, and the leaves, et cetera, et cetera. And so basically what you can see here is all the things we kind of talked about, um, but they also did report stress tolerance in these, in these um, tetraploids. So that's useful. Um, finally, the, you know, the, the next part is the, the seedlessness. And so this is just some, some examples that, to show you that we, we're, we're already using triploids. Like this is not something new that they came up for, for cannabis by any means, right? And so you know, on the left, you can see a wild banana and a seedless banana. And so you know, if, if you've ever come across a banana seed before, um, they're, they're quite large. They're really, they have a hard seed coat and they're, the ba bananas are basically inedible. And so in the case of the banana, you can see that it's now a big, delicious fruit with everything seeds. And then the next one is watermelon. And, you know, this one's, uh, this one's a kind of cool one because, you know, when I remember when I was young, most watermelons had seeds. And now I rarely see a watermelon with seeds. And so it's, it's just kind of neat to see agricultural technology change something. So um, watermelons are important in my life. So something so important and within, my, within my own um, somewhat short lifespan. So why are why are triploids seedless? Um, and, you know, this is just to you know just give an explanation of what's going on. And basically, what's going on here is during meiosis. This is the the process. If you if you don't remember back to high school biology, this is the process where um, you know the the cell is dividing and becoming the the pollen or the egg. So it's dividing. It's it's cutting its genome in half basically. So in a human setting, we would be going from a diploid to a haploid state. So if we go from you know you have two copies, each one of your sperms or eggs, whichever you happen to have has one copy of each of each gene or chromosome. In the case of uh, a, a triploid, what happens is that they try to divide in half, but you can't divide three in half. So what you end up with is unbalanced gametes. And so you, you don't, you know, you can't have one and a half copies of each gene. And so you end up with like aneuploids, you end up with all sorts of weird um, pollen grains and eggs. And in general, they're not viable. And so this is what makes them seedless. And 
you know, I think this is an important, or it's a good time to point out that when we say seedless, we mean seedless, not seedless. And so it's kind of like, you know, stainless steel. I, I remember thinking stainless steel doesn't stain. And then I came in, my stainless steel was all stained. Um, and so it does stain, it just stains less, right? And so we see the same thing with triploids. And, you know, in some species, we see pretty much, you know, what we see in the banana, you, you don't see any seeds. Um, in the watermelon, you see husks of seeds. And then in other cases, we actually see some viable seeds, right? And so, um, you know, it's important, an important point to say that this isn't a, a perfect solution all the time, right? And we'll come back to that, of course. Um, so now back to the, um, the increased allelic um, diversity and increased heterosis. And I'm going to have to take a bit of a, a, a detour here and talk about um, hybrid seed production and heterosis in general, um, because it's really important to what we're going to talk about with the uh, polyploids, right? And so what is heterosis? Um, this is also known as hybrid vigor. So it's basically the, the vigor that you see when you cross two um, genetically different um, plants or animals together, and the offspring grows bigger or better than the, either of the parents. And so in this example here, what we're looking at is um, on, on the right, um, you can see corns P1 and P2 are the parental lines, and then B is the hybrid. And what you see in the, the plant, you can see that the hybrid is much larger and more vigorous than the parents. And then when you look at the cobs, you can see that the central cob here, which is the hybrid, is much, much bigger than either of the parents. And so this is what we call hybrid vigor because the hybrid between the two is much more vigorous and productive than either of the parent were, right? So normally when we make a cross between two things, um, you know, if you have a tall person and a short person, you would expect the ch children to be sort of in between the two parents. But if hybrid vigor is there, then the child would be taller than either of the parents. That's essentially what's going on. Um, the mechanism of this is not fully understood. There's still, you know, you can read um, whole um, papers and special editions and probably books and whatnot about the mechanism behind this. And um, we still don't really know. Um, but we do think that, you know, the, the, one of the original theories is that what's going on here is that when you make these crosses between the right genetic backgrounds, you have a lot of heterozygous alleles which leads to the masking of um, recessive deleterious traits, right? And so basically this, what this means is that if you have like an inbred population, for example, and they have a, a, um, a genetic disorder um, because it's, a, it's fixed within the population, when you cross that with another population that doesn't have that disease, um, then the, most of the offspring won't have that. When you repeat that across the whole genome, you end up with hybrid vigor. Can I stop you for a second? Because yeah, that, I've listened to a lot of people talk about this subject and I've read a lot of uh, cannabis forums and stuff. I have never heard anybody explain why. Like they, they explain what they don't really explain. I know that you, that's just a, a theory that you, you, you said it's, it's not definite, but that, that makes a lot of sense that it, it suppresses those deleterious traits that we're trying to get away from. That, that I, I like that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Well, well thank you for interrupting. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and we'll go a little deeper for you then. Um, so basically, um, you know, when, when, you're, when you're making hybrids, usually what happens is you're crossing two inbred lines. And whether this is a true inbred line or just a, um, um, something someone's bred for a long time and is partially inbred, that's not really that important. But um, the important point here is that, on, so I'll start with the top left here, is when you inbreed plants or animals in that matter, or for that matter, uh, what you see is that over multiple generations of inbreeding, you get um, inbreeding depression. And basically this is the accumulation of recessive alleles that fix in the deleterious state. And so over time, um, you get runtier and runtier plants, but they're more stable. So they're more genetically uniform. Um, over here on the right, I won't spend too much time on this, but this is the mechanism that, that explains what's happening during inbreeding. But if you look at this, AA, a, big A, little A um, is the first, is that that's the first parent when you self pollinate that um, half of them will fix either in the big A big A or the little A little A and only half of them will still be heterozygous. This happens repeatedly over multiple generations and when you do this across the genome what this does is it makes the, the all of the genes become fixed in a homozygous state whether it's dominant or recessive um, it, that's that's not really the point but over about um, you know here you can see at S5 that's the fifth generation of self pollination you have about 47% fixed as big A, big A, and 46%, 47% fixed as little a, little a. And so basically what this means is as you inbreed, you lose genetic diversity, traits fix, but you also get runtier and runtier plants. 
And so this is one of the trade-offs when, you know, you know, if you're trying to breed stable seeds and you're doing it through inbreeding, um, you will be able to stabilize a lot of traits, but you're going to lose a lot of vigor and you're going to end up with these kind of, um, you know, runtier plants, right? Um, so yeah, I don't know if I explained that very well, but um, that's that's basically what what's yeah. going on. You're so a deep chunk. Yeah. <laughs> so when we look at this, this is an example again with rabbit a rabidopsis, and you know I, I didn't mean to pick on a rabidopsis too much. I'm a little racist against a rabidopsis, but um, I, I I hope there's no rabidopsis researchers that are going to get mad at me here. Um, but basically, what 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 we're showing here is that we have a C24 and LER. These are two isogenic inbred lines of um, Arabidopsis. And here's the F1 cross, you can see labeled F1. Um, I keep forgetting, you, you can't see my pointer. Um, and so basically what you can see in the F1 population is this is definitely an example of um, hybrid vigor. So you can see that the hybrid seeds grew much bigger and much stronger than the parents. Um, and so you can see that the C24 and the LER probably have inbreeding depression. When we make the cross, we get hybrid vigor. Um, and then what's interesting, and again, this is kind of an aside, but when we make a cross, if you try to keep your seeds from the F1s, if you try to cross your hybrids together to make more hybrid seed, you can see that the F2 generation is all over the place. And, you know, we don't have time to get into the mechanism of that, but basically when you cross two inbred lines because they're genetically identical, the F1 generation can only receive the fixed alleles from each parent, so it's genetically identical as well. But when you go to the next generation, they can give either of those, big A or little a or big, a, big B or little b, and then the F2 generation can go, will go all over the roadmap and you'll lose hybrid vigor, you'll lose uniformity, um, et cetera. Um, this is great for seed producers because then they have to come back and buy their F1 hybrid seed from you. They can't keep their own seed, right? Or else they'll lose all the benefits. But anyway, um, this is just a, a slide showing the importance of hybrid seeds. So, you know, not to, you know, I just like to give a real world example and this is um, corn yields. Um, and if you look at the average corn yield, and this is in bushels, bushels per acre, which is a silly unit, but, um, but it's, it's, it's what they, they used in this graph. Um, but basically, you can see that for basically from the six, uh, 1865 to, you know, the 1930s, we had pretty much a level yield, right, of around, you know, 24 bushels per acre kind of thing. What you can see happened in the 1920s or 30s is that they started making hybrid seed. And you can see that the yields just took off. And, you know, now we're sitting, I hear about people going over 200 bushels per acre quite often, right? And so, you know, we're looking at probably like a, a seven-fold increase in yields. And so, you know, the other thing that happened during this period, though, is synthetic um, fertilizers and pesticides and all that jazz. So um, people usually contribute or attribute approximately 50% of these gains to genetics and 50% to, um, you know, chemical inputs and agronom agronomic advances. So even at 50%, though, you know, this really shows the advantage of hybrid seed. And so I, I, like, I like the example of corn because it's kind of analogous to cannabis in some ways is that it was a open pollinated uh, crop. So that we produced uh, seeds and cultivars using open pollinated strategies, and then they've switched over to hybrids. And so, you know, I predict over time, that's what's gonna happen. Um, except in the case of cannabis, I, I, I don't know if it will. Um, just because people don't like to grow the same thing over and over and it takes years to generate hybrids and stuff like that. But I digress. Um, another important point here is that not all hybrids will display heterosis. So, you know, if I cross two plants, just because they're genetically dif different from each other, doesn't mean I'm going to get heterosis, right? And so, you know, how do we ensure that we do get heterosis? Um, we basically want to choose plants that are genetically distant from each other and genetically uniform, um, but more importantly, um, with complementary genetics. And so you could have two plants that are genetically distant from each other. You may or may not get a heterosis. You wanna make sure that they're complementary. And so, you know, this is an example with corn. Um, and basically they're much further ahead in corn, um, as you can imagine, um, but they have them separated into heterotic groups. So these are, this is a genetic analysis of different um, corn groups and basically you, you that what they've determined is that if you take a plant from E73 and cross it with W19 you'll have good hybrid vigor or maybe I don't know about that that's I, I just picked those two out of my hat but um, basically they've charted the genetics and they figured that these groups are good pairs these groups are good pairs maybe these two groups are not good pairs etc um, and the reason I mention this is that you know some sometimes further down this talk we're going to see that you know, sometimes when we make crosses at, at the tetraploid level, we don't see what you might expect, or we see different results from each other. And, you know, the genetic background is critical for a lot of these things, right? 
So finally, back to polyploids. Um, hopefully, hopefully, all that rant was a uh, um, was going somewhere. Um, but basically, when you have a polyploid, um, you have more copies of each gene, right? And so, if you have a diploid, you have. And if we're looking at one single allele or one one single um, gene, um, what you see is you can have big A, big A, big A, little A, little A, little A. Um, when you get into the triploids, you can see you have more options. When you get into the tetraploids, you have even more options. Um, However, you know, that explanation is actually quite flawed because that assumes that you only have two choices for the gene, either a big A or a little bit A. In reality, um, you know, each gene can have many, many different versions, right? Like if we look through a population, you know, the, the, you know, if you look at eye color, for example, it's not just, there's, it's not just one gene. It's not just, uh, you know, blue or brown. It's, it's nothing like that. Um, and so the theory here is that in a tetraploid you can theoretically you could have four different versions of a single gene all in the same cell all operating at the same time um and what they do together who knows right but um you know basically basically if we go back to the principle of heterosis if we have um you know um heterozygosity we get heterosis in a tetraploid we can have even more hetero um, heterozygosity so now I, I just wanted to touch on a couple of the, um, you know, the, the, the less attractive parts about uh, polyploids. So, you know, the, the obvious question, if polyploids are so great, why don't we make everything polyploids and, and that kind of stuff, right? Um, and in some cases, they can grow slower. And so polyploids are not always better than diploids um, by a long shot. Um, they can have extended flower periods. That's something that we wouldn't want to see. Um, and it can be harder to fix traits. So when you get into breeding at the polyploid level, it can get quite complicated. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch, I'll come back to that. Um, so, you know, basically they're not always better than diploids. It really depends on what you're growing them for, what the, you know, what, what the plant is, um, and, and a number of different factors. Um, so why is it hard to fix traits in a polyploid? And again, like, you know, we're going to go back to, um, this is like the Mendelian genetics. Um, basically if you have a, a, a big A, little A times crossed with a big A, little A, um, you can see that you have four different possibilities in your children and one quarter of those will be fixed as a recessive trait. And so if you're trying to say fix a plant with um, disease resistance, for example, in the case of uh, a diploid, one in four plants would be resistant to that if it was a single gene, um, if you're lucky enough to have a single gene resistance, right? Um, if you look at a polyploid at the, the you know, this is basically um, this diploid made into a polyploid, let's say, and then you, you, you cross it with itself and try to select the, um, the progeny that are fixed recessive traits you can see that only one out of 36 seedlings is actually um, A, 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 or little A, little A, little A, little A, right? And so in the case of a diploid, you have one in four. In the case of a, a tetraploid, you have one in 36, right? Not good math. Oh, sorry. Um, it only gets worse when you have multiple traits. So, you know, a lot of traits are not a single gene. Um, and so, you know, again, if you have two, if you have a trait that's controlled by two genes, let's say, and you want to fix it both in the recessive um, state, you can see with a diploid, you would have one in 16 because, you know, one in four times one in four is one in 16. In the case of a tetraploid, you would have one in over a thousand, right? And so, in, you know, in the, in, the, in the diploid, you could grow out, let's say, 20 plants, and you're probably going to find one that has both of those traits. In the case of a tetraploid, you would have to grow out a thousand, and you still might not have that tra those two traits fixed. And so, you know, fixing traits at the tetraploid level is very difficult. Um, and it only gets this this issue only compounds as you get more and more traits. So if you if you have a, a selection of traits that you want to fix, um, you should you better do it at the diploid state before you even get into tetraploid. Um, but that being said, that doesn't mean that there's not potential to breed at the tetraploid level. It just means that um, if you're trying to fix traits, it's better to fix them before you tetraploid and then go down the path of tetraploiding. So how do we make tetraploids? Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that this is a naturally occurring phenomenon. And it is, um, but we can't sit around waiting for the one in a million or whatever it happens to be um, chances. So we we intervene, and basically what we do here is we 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 germinate seeds or we take a cutting. You can do this from a clonal line or a, or a seedling; it doesn't really matter. Um, we remove the tissue, typically put it into tissue culture, um, and you know theoretically you can do this outside of tissue culture. Um, there is a there is a paper out there where they did this, but. Um, from what we've seen, the, the treatment really, really hurts them. And I suspect your success rates would be super low. And I've talked to some people trying to do it and they've had very, very uh, low success rates. So um, we do it in tissue culture. So we bring them into tissue culture. Um, we treat them with a mitotic inhibitor. Um, and I'll, I'll explain what that is. Um, then we regenerate plants from those meristems. We uh, analyze them through flow cytometry. 
and then we maintain the cultures in, in, in tissue culture and then eventually bring them into the, um, the growth facility. So that's kind of an overview, pretty straightforward. Um, so how do mitotic inhibitors work? So this is a, you know, this is last time we saw meiosis, this time it's mitosis. And so this is a, this is just a, what happens when cells divide. So basically, if you look at the top under normal mitosis, we have chromosome duplication. So this is the stage where um, your, the, your cell's about to, you know, your cell's about, your, your cell's ready to divide. So it, it doubles its DNA. Um, the chromosomes line up. Um, you can see in that little um, picture. Then microtubules form to pull them away. So they pull the, two, two, the, the, the paired chromosomes apart into the opposite ends of the cell, and then they divide. Um, and you have two diploid cells. What we do is we treat it with uh, colchicine or um, we prefer a risolin just because it's less toxic to humans um, and we care about our humans. Um, and basically we take a diploid cell, um, the, the chromosomes duplicate just like they normally would. Um, the, tubules tr the, the microtubules try to form, but this um, compound interferes with that process. And so instead of the cells getting, or instead of the chromosomes getting pulled apart to the opposite ends of the cell, they basically just stay in the center or do whatever they do. Um, and the cell can't pull them to the, to the opposite ends to divide. And so when the cell division happens, um, it ends up being um, a cell with two copies of each gene, right? I believe in plants, um, it basically produces an empty cell and a tetraploid cell. Um, don't quote me on that one, but I think that's what's happening. So anyway, um, that's, that's the process and how it works. And then once we remove them from the mitotic inhibitor, they can resume normal cell cycles and they start dividing as tetraploids. Um, some of the challenges with this, and this is a, it's a major challenge actually, is that um, when we look at a meristem, and this is just a, a, a diagram of a meristematic dome in the, the primordia, um, basically what you can see is that there's many, many cells. And so when we treat them with the colchicine or risolin or whatever, um, you know, there's no guarantee that all of the cells are going to convert into tetraploids. So, you know, the cell cycles are not synchronized. They're not all going at the same time. So, you know, we might have some of the cells convert, some of the cells remain diploid. And what happens is we end up with plants that are a mixture of the two. So we have diploids and tetraploids existing in the same plant as a chimera, or, or as we refer to them as mixoploids. Um, and so basically, um, you know, they're not a pure tetraploid, they're not a pure diploid, they're somewhere in the middle. And the problem with this is that over time, the diploids can take over and basically it can revert back to a diploid plant. And we, we have seen this um, with some of the plants that we've made. Um, and there's a few strategies you can use to um, um, prevent that, but um, it, is a, it is a major concern. Um, so flow cytometry is the tool that we use to kind of help with this. And so, you know, for flow cytometry, basically what we're doing is we're extracting the nuclei. So we take the, the cells and chop them up in a, in a specific buffer. Um, we stain them with a fluorescent dye, and then we inject them into the flow cytometer. And in this, um, in this diagram here, you can see that um, basically what happens is you have your nuclei going in the top port here, and they, they basically go single file through um, a beam of, of particles. And this particle, these particles, um, we shine a light on them essentially, and then we measure the fluorescent signal that comes off them. And essentially what's going on here is that each nuclei passes through this beam of light and we take a reading from each of the nuclei and the amount of fluorescence is proportional to the amount of DNA in that nucleus. And so then we can estimate the size of the, D of the, of the nucleus and the genome size um, by proxy, right? And so it's, um, it can get kind of uh, messy, but um, it, that's how we do it. Uh, this is kind of what the data looks like, or this is what the data looks like. So in the top left, you can see a soybean standard. Um, we use the soybean because it's, uh, it's just a no we know how big the, the soybean genome is. So we use that as an internal standard just to make sure that the um, instrument is calibrated right and um, we can estimate our DNA um, appropriately. On the top right is what a diploid looks like. So you can see labeled in kind of a orange color there, you can see the diploid cannabis peak and then you can see the soybean. So you can see that the soybean has a larger um, genome than cannabis. Um, cannabis is coming in around, uh, the units don't really mean much, but it's coming in around 60. Um, in the bottom left, you can see what a tetraploid looks like. So now all of a sudden you can see that the one labeled orange is to the right of the, the soybean. So now our tetraploid plant has a larger um, nucleus or uh, genome than the soybean, as we would expect. And then on the bottom right, you can see what a mixoploid looks like. And so um, you can see the soybean in the middle, but then you have a peak to the left and to the right. And what this is showing is that we have some cells that are diploid, some cells that are tetraploid. And so in our screening process, we would eliminate those and only keep the ones that are reading tetraploid. Um, the one aside, though, is that even when you do this, um, you know, nothing, nothing's perfect. You know, we, we sample a leaf from a plant, um, it tests tetraploid, 
but that doesn't mean that the whole plant is a tetraploid. Um, we've only taken a subsample. And so, you know, this isn't perfect and we can still have reversions. So you, you really have to keep your eye on this. Okay. So, you know, I, th I think we're, we're half hour in and I haven't even talked really about cannabis. So now, now on to cannabis. Um, so, you know, why, why are we interested in tetraploidy? Um, you know, it sounds great. We want larger flowers. Tetraploids can give us larger flowers. We want bigger plants. That's, that's something we, this can do. Um, we, we love stress resistance. We want to manipulate secondary metabolism. Um, we want to prevent fertilization and seed production. And so these are all things that tetraploidy or polyploidy can offer, right? Um, there's a few reports out there. Um, it's, it, it's still new technology relatively. And, you know, the one thing I will say is that, um, you know, we, we started working on this in like, um, I think it was 2019 when we started and, you know, things take time and, you know, we, we're, we're, we're now um, in the process of, you know, building out our tetraploid catalog and, you know, we have a bunch of triploids made and stuff, but um, we're, we're still in the process. So any breeding program takes time um, and that's just the reality of it. But yeah, this is just a, a picture of some of our, our, our tetraploid babies, right? You can see a nice fat um, tetraploid leaf. This is very typical of a tetraploid right there. So this is one of the, the earlier reports, um, not the earliest, but one of the earlier ones where they went into a little more detail. Um, and this was the high THC line, or a, I think it's a balanced line, actually. It's not a necessarily high THC line, but it's, a, it's, a, it's cannabis um, for sure. Um, and so, you know, some of the things I see, some of the typical things, these are common across most tetraploids, is that we have increased leaf width. Um, we have fewer, longer stomates, increased fresh weight, um, all of the things that we kind of associate with uh, tetraploids. But no one really cares about those things when we're talking about cannabis. So, you know, are they better? What what are the the real important things? So, when they when they looked at the yield, they saw no significant difference. So, the yield was pretty much the same. Cannabinoid percentage they had a slight increase in uh, in CBD um, in this balanced genotype. Um, they saw some minor changes in terpenes. They were not statistically significant, but they saw some minor changes. Um, nothing to write home about. And so, you know, really no significant benefit. And you know, I, I remember after this paper came off, a lot of people were kind of writing off. Um, writing off tetraploids is not really, you know, nothing to see here kind of thing. Um, and I think, you know, they're, 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 the devil's in the details sometimes. And, you know, in this case, they only looked at the induced tetraploids. So they had a diploid and a tetraploid version of that clone. Um, they didn't test it in different conditions. Um, and so it's really worth further evaluation, right? And so, you know, these pictures, again, the, the flowers look pretty si similar. Um, we do find that the, the, the tetraploid phenotype fades during flowering, so it's not as obvious, but you know, during the vegetative period, you can see nice fat leaves on the tetraploid um, and thinner leaves on the diploid. That's right. I was pointing at them and you guys can't see that. So um, you'll have to, you'll have to go back and look. Um, so as I said, in that, in that study, they used gen one tetraploids. And what I mean by that is they, they took a, a diploid, they doubled the chromosomes. And if you look here, um, my formatting messed up a little bit, but basically if you have big A, little a, and you turn that into a tetraploid, now you have big A, big A, little a, little a, across the whole genome, right? And so you have not changed heterozygosity at all. It's exactly the same as the diploid. The only difference that you've made is you've changed the dosage of each gene, right? And so, you know, that that's fine. I mean, you know, if, if, if that gives you the effects that you're looking for, that's fine. Um, but, you know, when I was saying a lot of people kind of wrote off tetraploidy at this point, it was kind of, it was kind of funny because the real magic is going to happen when you start shuffling up those genes. It's, it's you know, a, a, an auto tetraploid from a diploid, um, we wouldn't expect that much difference. We would only expect the dosage effects, not the heterozygosity effects, right? And so, you know, we talked to a lot of people that, you know, they're like, oh, I want a tetraploid version of this clone. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of problems with that. One is that, it, you know, it, it can easily revert to a diploid. But the other problem is you're, you're really not getting the full benefits of tetraploid um, at that point. And so, you know, another paper came out more recently, and this is uh, from Crawford et al. Um, he was working with, or he's part of Oregon CBD. Um, and this is a really good paper. They, there was a lot more thorough. And they, what they did is they produced diploid, triploid, and tetraploid crosses. And so the crosses were pretty much the same, or they were the same, um, except that the ploidy level was different. And, you know, just as an aside, you know, you, when you're talking about a triploid, you can never have the same cross because you have two thirds of your genetics coming from one parent and one third from the other. So it won't be exactly the same. And it's, that's an impossibility. So they did the best they could. And uh, it's, it's a really good paper. Um, so anyway, when they looked at the tetraploid versus diploid, basically what they found is that the yield was similar. Um, so that's kind of similar to the Parsons paper um, with, the, with the auto tetraploid. But their total cannabinoid content in the tetraploid was 43 percent higher than the diploid. And so, you know, that's a significant increase um, and something to kind of 
um, should pique your interest, I guess. And this was in a, a hemp line, so it was a high CBG line, and so most of that increase was CBG. Um, so whether or not that translates to THC, you know, time will tell, right? And so our experience, like I said, we started in 2019. Um, this, this works all um, from Austin Baton. He's a master's student that was in my lab, and he he did all the work. I take all the credit. That's the that's the deal. Um, I didn't tell him that was the deal, but that's the deal. Um, and so basically, what I'm what I'm showing you here is that this is just some different treatments. And so you know, survival. We have you know in our control, we have 100% survival as we should. Um, when we treat it with a Rizalin for 24 or 48 hours, I think this was 20 micromoles or something like that. Um, we have about a 75% survival. Um, probably a little bit lower regrowth. Um, about 40% are still diploid, so it doesn't always work. So um, basically, what, what you're trying to do here is, um, you know, they don't like being treated with orizin or colchicine. So you're trying to find the amount of orizin or colchicine that um, induces tetraploidy but doesn't kill your plant. You have to ride that um, that fine line there, right? Um, more importantly, I guess, is the the number of tetraploids. You can see 40, 44%, and 30%. Um, and the number of mixoploids, and these are the obvious mixoploids that we detected, so about 10% and 30%. And so basically what you can see here in the 48-hour treatment, about half of those tetraploids that you've created are actually mixoploids, and they're probably going to revert. Um, a bunch of the other ones, these that read tetraploid, are probably mixoploids, and they're going to revert. Um, and, you know, in this one, it looks a little better, um, but it's only as good as you trust your instruments and, your, and, your, and stuff like that. So anyway, um, that, that's kind of it. So, you know, you, you test the different conditions, you find the best one, and you go from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, Can I interrupt again for a second? Yeah. Is uh, since we're talking about breeding, an important part of that is like uh, calling out weak plants. Would you uh, correlate what's happening here with like it, it naturally calling out the weaker plants, or is it just some plants are they don't like the treatment? Um, so I mean that you know the treatment's pretty harsh on the plant. It's you're really like messing with it. So I I don't think it's about like these are these are uh, I, I don't think it's about weak plants or not. I think it's just about um, you know. I don't know why some die and some don't, but um, you know, even if we do this with clonal lines, like uh, th this was a seedling population, but if we did it with clonal lines, we still have some die. And you know, our our target is actually to kill about half of them because that's kind of the sweet spot where you know we'll kill off half of them, and then the ones that do survive, we get the most tetraploids and the fewest mixoploids. If you use a dosage where none of your plants die, you're going to end up with a lot of mixoploids, right? And so you know, it's it's better to kill off half of them. Um, because the ones that do survive are more likely to be quality, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, right on. Um, and then you know these pictures are just on the top right is a that's a little diploid plant in tissue culture, and then the bottom right that's a that's a tetraploid in tissue culture. And so again, you can see the fat um, the, at the extra wide leaves, um, typical tetraploid stuff. Um, these are just some more pictures of, of some of our uh, tetraploid babies. So this, uh, the, the one on the left was on the, the, the cover slide, but this is just uh, the seedlings coming up. So these are these are tetraploid seedlings. You can see that this is very typical of what tetraploids look like. So the really fat, um, um, the fat leaves like that. Um, we see quite a few on the top right. You can see some leaf abnormalities. We see quite a few of this type of thing. So on the top right image, you can see that that um, that that leaf seems to have some extra leaflets coming out from the center because it does. Um, and so that, that we, we see a high amount of that. Um, the, the picture of the stem there, I don't know if you can really see it, but um, they tend to be very thick and kind of juicy, um, the stems. Um, so they, they are thicker stemmed, um, but you know, I don't have any data for this, but they seem to be higher water content. Um, where the leaves, where the branches attach, they seem to have that really, um, you know, um, they look like they're glued on kind of um, look. Um, and then the bottom right, those are just some older ones when we're, uh, we, were, we were flowering them out. Just kind of what they look like. Okay, okay so in general, we like polyploids, um, as, as you would probably imagine from um, the amount of time I've spent on this. But um, this is a picture of a, a, a diploid and a tetraploid. Um, and this is two scale. So this is on day 32 of flower. So you can see the tetraploid is much, much larger than the diploid. Um, it's a big beefy plant. Um, and, and that's about it. So, um, like I said, we, we, we like the tetraploids. This is what it looked like. This is the whole tetraploid. So, and we, you know, we grew it, the, we grew them out and this was consistent across all the tetraploids. So, um, it wasn't just a, a one-off or anything. Um, so the four end harvest was on day 48. So we, we harvested our tetraploids on day 48 and we harvested this based on, um, you know, the trichome morphology, um, you know, about 95% were, 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 were cloudy and about 5% were just starting to turn amber. 
Um, we noticed that the tetraploids were finished first, so we harvested them based on the harvest date. And you know, this is a, another aside: is a lot of researchers they they want to harvest all their plants on day X, even though the plants aren't already on day X. So you know, when you have a treatment that's changing the harvest date, you should change your harvest date um, to coincide with that. And so that's what we did. Um, this is a close up of the trichomes. So, you know, the, the one other thing that, you know, again, I don't have data for this, but the one observation we made is that the trichomes tend to be much longer in the tetraploids. Um, I do suspect that this will um, have implications for extraction and, you know, especially hash making and things like that. Um, but again, we don't have any solid data on that, just an observation. Um, this is the, um, the, the diploid version. So they, we harvest them on day 68. And so if you remember, we harvested the tetraploids on day 48 versus 68. So that's a pretty big difference, right? Um, but, the, you know, the plants looked pretty good, um, except that we did get some, some fungal. Um, we had some bud rot issues, which kind of interfered with some of our, um, our plans. But, um, you know, this is really, um, you know, in my opinion, this is kind of, you know, the silver lining or the take home message to me is it's, it, you know, there's advantages to have a really fl fast flower cycle. So the tetraploid reduction in flower time is kind of good in that way for IPM purposes. And so if you look at the data, um, you know, it, it, it was our earlier harvest. So you can see 68 versus 48. Um, but if you look at the, the floral weight per plant, um, it was 230 versus 170. So in this case, what we saw is that the diploids filled out a lot faster and matured really quickly, but the final size of the plant was actually smaller. Um, and so, you know, it, you have the, this flower fla fa faster flower cycle, but you get lower yields. Um, but if you work out the yield on a per day basis, so you know if you you know you could do more cycles with tetraploids, um, basically they're comparable. So the the amount of yield isn't really different between the tetraploids and the diploids in our case. Um, but you have a fl faster flower cycle. And you, you know this. What's the bottom line you see on this slide? Uh, harvest index. Okay, so sorry, this this cut off uh, probably the most important part of the slide. Let me just find out. I, I, I don't want to lie to you with the numbers here. Um, but the biggest difference that we saw here between our, uh, our diploid and tetraploid is that the, the diploid was 13 to 16% THC and the tetraploid was 21 to 23% THC. And so we had about a 50% increase in THC content. And this is kind of in line with um, um, the Crawford paper where they found a 40 something percent increase in cannabinoid content. And basically what this is showing is that that can transfer over into THC as well. Um, obviously, if you have something that's already producing 25%, I don't think it's going to bump you up to like 40%. I, I, I don't believe that at all. But um, in some cases, we see an increase in THC. And in our case, we did. Which is good because 16% is, uh, as my friend says, if it's, you know, he said if it's under 25% to him, it's compost. So, um, so if it's 16%, that's no good. But um, hopefully that changes. Anyway, um, so the summary of tetraploids is that, you know, they have large leaves and some abnormalities. Um, they tend to have larger, fewer stomates. Um, and the reason I'm highlighting this is that it, it, it probably does impact water relations. And so when we were talking about them being more, uh, potentially more stress tolerant to abiotic stresses, um, you know, the, the stomates play a large role in how they respond to drought and stuff, right? So that could be important. Um, similar yields, um, at least on a, a calendar basis. Um, potential increase in cannabinoid levels, especially when you get into the, uh, the um, tetraploid crosses, not just the first generation. So what about triploids? Um, and so, uh, you know, there's huge potential in triploids. This is really, um, this was my main interest in, in producing um, cannabis polyploids. But, you know, the real promise here is no seeds or very few seeds. Um, you know, even if your neighbor is growing hemp, even if your neighbor has a hermaphrodite, even if you have a hermaphrodite, um, you know, no matter what, theoretically, you shouldn't get any, you shouldn't get many seeds. Um, it also provides breeder protection. And so, you know, the, the one people, the one thing people always, you know, the obvious thing here is that if you're producing outdoor um, or even in, you know, in, in some indoor settings, um, you know, you don't get any seeds. Um, but of equal importance is that if you're a breeder and you're putting years into developing this really special strain, um, you know, triploids give you a mechanism to protect other people from using that in their breeding programs, right? And so if you want to, um, if you want to release these genetics, but you don't want your competitors to have that access to your genetics to breed with, um, this is a tool that you can use, right? Um, so basically, you know, um, this is from Crawford all again, and uh, basically it works in hemp. Um, and so, you know, in their, in their one trial, they had eight seeds in the triploid versus 356 seeds in the diploid. 
And so these were obviously intentionally pollinated. So, you know, you wouldn't see pollen loads that high normally. Um, the other thing that's important to note is that of those eight seeds, most of them were husks. And so, you know, similar to the seedless watermelon, you just get these little seed husks, but they're not fully developed seeds. Um, of another interesting thing they reported in this paper um, is that, you know, the, the, the fertility, they reported reduced fertility in tetraploids and specifically they found that tetraploids can't pollinate diploids. Um, we have had mixed results with this. Sometimes we, you know, we've used tetraploid pollen and produced triploid seed and diploid parents like several times and with quite good success. Um, but then other times we've had problems doing that. And so, you know, sometimes pollination is a little finicky. Um, my suspicion is that with the tetraploid pollen, it's even more finicky, but it's not impossible. Um, this is also from Cro the, the Crawford paper, um, but basically they, yeah, they have triploid hemp on the market, um, almost seedless, about 2%. Um, but more importantly, or of equal importance, is they also see an increased biomass in the triploid. So they had about 30% increase in biomass, and they saw this both indoors and outdoors. And so if you see in this picture, you can see that the triploid on the right um, has a, it's just a more vigorous and robust plant. If you look at the floral structure on the bottom right, you can see that they, the, you know, larger flowers, the colas seem to go down further um, down the main stem. That might just be a consequence of being a bigger, uh, more robust plant. I, I don't really know. Um, but either way, they got about a 30% increase in yield. Um, the cannabinoid levels were kind of between the diploids and the tetraploids, so they weren't significantly different than either. But basically, when we look at this, what we see is that the higher ploidy level seems to increase cannabinoid content. And so it goes diploids were the lowest, triploids are the middle, and then tetraploids were the highest. But the triploids gave the, the, the yield boost. And just as another aside, you know, th this sometimes we see this in other plants too, where the diploid and the tetraploid might be kind of similar, but then the triploid specifically is more robust like this. So our experience, um, you know, we're, we, I don't really have much to share um, with our experience, but we are, we are currently growing out a lot of our triploids. Um, this is one of our triploids that we're growing out. It's not a great picture, but it's, uh, it's the best picture I have right now. Um, but basically what we, what we can say is that the seedlessness we have observed um, matches what they reported in there for most of the time. Um, so very few seeds, mostly husks. But what I will say is that the degree of seedlessness does vary. So we have one triploid line that, um, you know, we need to do a little bit more work and verify that it is indeed a triploid, but I'm pretty sure it is. Um, but it's producing seeds. Um, not as many as a diploid would, but more than I would expect from a triploid. And so, you know, I think it, it you know, it, it really matters what the genetic background is and that kind of stuff. So, you know, you have to, um, you know, be open and honest about the benefits and, and, and def deficiencies of these things, but um, that's, that's kind of where it is. So anyway, um, yield trials are ongoing. Um, I think they look promising, but um, um, we're not there yet. So the summary is, uh, you know, poly polyploid is promising for cannabis. I, I um, I think it has a lot of promise. So, you know, increasing cannabinoid content seems to be pretty solid. So it's a, it's a good way to boost cannabinoids. Um, it, it can increase yields. I, I believe that this is, um, you know, there's a little bit more breeding work that needs to be done, but I, I believe that that's definitely a potential application. Um, stress tolerance, we don't really know, but from other species, we, we could um, assume that it could be a thing. And there's a number of other advantages that I think will come out when, especially when we start doing a lot more breeding at the polyploid level and just sort of learning a little bit more about the plant itself. Um, so it is still newish, um, you know, many unknowns. I think the results, are, you know, they vary a lot based on the genetic background. So, you know, we really have to, um, you know, dig into cannabis research and, and, and get there. And then my last slide, this is kind of off topic, I guess, but um, this is just a little tree frog that I found in my, my home greenhouse. Um, and it's off topic, except for the one fact that um, tree frogs can be tetraploid. Um, or diploid. So I don't know. I didn't. I didn't run the flow cytometry on this guy, so I can't tell you. But, um, but there you go. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions. Okay. Before we get to that, Peter up, uploaded the uh, slide that was cut off for you. Up oh, there, he goes. He's he's already showing it before I can get to it. So, <coughs> so that's what was missing before. So that this this presentation is complete because he worked so hard on it, and it was amazing. By the way. It's like I had a lot of questions going through it. And later on in the slide, you had a slide coming up later on that answered it for me. So no need for me to be redundant. A very <laughs> well done uh, presentation there. Is there anything that you want to on this slide while you've got it? Uh, no, no, I, I, I think I covered it verbally. But as you can see, uh, you know, the, the, the THC content was um, in line with what Crawford said. Um, so um, so there you go. 
um, it's quite a significant increase. All right, right on. Uh, so let's, uh, before I get into the comments and looking for questions over there, uh, the one that I ran by you before the show, uh, the one branch uh, thing, can, is, uh, it was, it was asked earlier in an earlier show if one branch could uh, possibly become a, a polyploid. And can you address that before we move on? Yeah, and I, I, you know, I'd, I'd say it's theoretically possible, but I'd say it's nearly practically impossible. Um, you know, for, for that to happen in a single cell, um, that's, you know, I, I, I could see that happening, but I, I just don't believe that that single tetraploid cell would um, overtake the others and become the whole branch. And so I, I, I'd be surprised to see that happen. Gotcha. Okay. Here's one sort of related. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, uh, the, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I thought you were reading it. That's, I wasn't yeah, going you while you were reading. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd be surprised to see it. I've, I've never actually heard of that in other species or anything. So uh, I could be wrong. But um, as far as I know, that's not really a, a common thing by any means. Um, you know, if, if you had a big plant and you treated it with colchicine or something, you might be able to get that branch to turn into a polyploid. Um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, and well, people have done that, so and you, you could do that, but spontaneous, I'd, I'd be really surprised. Okay. The way it normally happens in nature is through unreduced gametes. And so um, in nature, what, what will happen is the odd pollen grain doesn't go through meiosis properly, and we'll have two copies of each gene, and then you could have a triploid progeny. And if that happens on both sides, you could end up with a tetraploid. And that sounds like a rare event, but when you look at millions and millions of seeds, it's a thing that does happen. And so most spontaneous tetraploid in nature would be from um, through sexual reproduction. Right on. Yes, I'm not seeing that you're getting a lot of compliments on your presentation over here, but I'm not seeing a lot of questions. So I guess that's good. You, that means you covered a lot of ground. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. That's a, I really appreciate talking to scientists like yourself because uh, you, you continually point out that life is not black and white. There's a lot of gray area out there, especially when you're dealing with things like this. And it was, with breeding, it's complicated enough as it is. And what you're doing is adding a lot of extra complication to it, but the benefits seem to be worth the extra complication. So what, what you mentioned about how doing the, uh, if you wanna stabilize some traits, doing that with uh, the diploids first, before you move into the polyploid work, that, that, I think that that was a great tip to, to share. And it's like, I, you may have uh, shared a little too much there, actually. It's, that, that's, that's, gonna, that's, gonna te that's gonna help people quite a bit. Uh, possibly your, uh, your buddy's competition that you were uh, highlighting at the beginning of the show. And I also appreciate the uh, full disclosure there also because it comes up later well, I mean, and it causes problems. <laughs> yeah, well, so yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I, I, I I am involved in that company, so um, you know our our real mission is to enable people to use this technology. So it's it's it, you know it's it's good for people to know what to do, um, and you know if you need help doing it, that's kind of one of our goals, right? Um, and you know at, at heart, I guess I'm a, I'm a professor first, I guess, so I, I tend to share everything, right? Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. As, uh, this question, I don't know what the context is because it's pretty high up in the list. I don't know exactly what they're uh, referring to there. Like, like when I'm talking about inbreeding, um, like if, if, if it's referring to the inbreeding, um, what we would typically do in, in the case of cannabis, what we would typically do is we would take a, a plant and we would take a cutting. So we'd have two plants that are genetically the same. We'd reverse one into a female or into a male, sorry, and use that pollen to cross the other one. So it's essentially the same as a self-pollination event. Um, but they're, they're two individuals, but they're genetically the same individual. Um, and so when we make that cross, that's a self-pollination event genetically. Okay. And you can also do it on a single plant, but we, we, we prefer to do it the other way. Yeah. Any particular reason why you prefer doing it the other way? Um, I'd say mostly just to, you know, when you're reversing plants to produce male flowers, um, you know, 
trying to re trying to get it just right so that you only reverse part of the plant or reverse it just enough to produce pollen and um, eggs is a is a challenge. I am also cognizant of the, you know, I, I, I don't know that I believe this, but the, the potential that there could be epi, epigenetic um, carryover if you collect it from the plant that you treated. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm skeptical that that does happen, but it's theoretically possible for sure. So, you know, it's better not to collect seeds from a plant that was reversed, in my opinion, just to yeah. play it safe. As you're not the first scientifically minded person to, that I've heard that from. I just heard that a few weeks ago also. It's, it's, it's yeah. best to not, you're already dealing with a lot of complication. Best to not add any more variables in there. It's, uh, was it the, uh, oh, uh, it's slipping my mind right now. But uh, there's a, a maxim, uh, not Moore's law, but Murphy's law. Or uh, anyway, I was, I'm, now I'm just sounding like a pothead. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I'm not, it's not coming to me. Uh, so anyway, I'm not seeing a lot of questions over here. And that's, I guess that's, there we go. Okay. Peter found one. Yeah. So we, the way we've been doing, you, some people do treat the seeds. Um, and so that is a method to do it. We, we usually germinate the seeds first and we do that in tissue culture. And then once the, once the seedlings about, you know, that big or whatever, um, we actually remove the apical meristem and treat the apical meristem, and we soak it in a solution of um, arizolin. And so, um, like I said, you can do it from seeds, but um, we prefer to do it, to do it this way, just because yes. you know we're we're doing it in tissue culture, and so um, it, this way we know they're clean and not contaminated before we do the treatment. Um, and there's a number of reasons that we we just prefer it that way. All right. I just found the list of what he starred over here is a, with all of the questions. So that's a, that would have been handier earlier when I was looking for this. That's a, that's where he found that one. I think it's a lot easier than going back through time in the, in the chat. And I was, I was trying to think of Occam's razor is adding variables to, to things causes, causes problems mm -hmm. that we're not, not looking for. So yeah, that's a, uh, as I said, as talking to scientists is very refreshing because there's a tendency in in, in cannabis and uh, well, just gardeners in general to like to they they, they like to live in that black they they, w they would like to live in that black and white world, but thinking that way causes a lot of problems that they're not even is that uh, I'm repeating myself now, but I said I really appreciate it. I <laughs> said that's what yeah. I keep doing it so that's uh you you were mentioning the the negatives of uh polyploidy and one of them was a longer flowering time and then later on you showed a very fast plant in my opinion as a uh, 50 days that's that's quick yeah, yeah 58 days and that it was very fast especially considering the the diploid um version was 68 days so it, it did reduce it um and so you know, the, the extended flowering period, that's just from the literature and other species. That's not what we saw. Um, so it doesn't seem to be a problem in cannabis. And, you know, when we're talking about polyploidy, there's so, so many factors that play into this. So like, you know, every, every plant's obviously different. And then, you know, within cannabis, they're very different. So, you know, that's what we saw in this genotype. I wouldn't be surprised to see when we do it in another, another genotype, we might not see that. We might see, we could see extended flowering time, right? Um, okay. It, it's really hard to say. And, you know, it, it really depends on, you know, when, when you're making a polyploid, you're doubling your genes, but what genes are you doubling, right? And yeah. so, you know, if, if depending on the, the genetic makeup of the plant, you could have very different outcomes from doing this. Um, there's some things that do seem to be consistent, but then others, not so much. Okay. I, I did find a, a pretty decent question here. Is you willing to share that? Yeah. So I, I believe we were using 20 micromoles of Arizolin. Um, I think that was the, the best. I, you know, there's uh, in the Parson paper, they go through a whole, um, you know, a comparison of different concentrations and different durations. It was quite thorough. Um, so, you know, if you want more information, um, that paper has it all, but I, I believe we landed on 20. All right. There's a, thank you for sharing that. Uh, so you're, you are very open. Like you said, maybe that's your professor's nature, but as a people, people like to protect their IP, especially when they've put so much work into it. So I, I, I again, I appreciate that, uh, that openness. It's, it's very helpful to everyone involved. 
Yeah, and you, you know the the like the process of doing this is it's pretty straightforward. But you know the again the the devil's in the details. So there's there's a number of places it can go wrong and stuff. Um, but the, but the the general process is fairly straightforward. Right on. It's a, a, the seedlessness. Like I, I like the comparison with the watermelons that you made at the beginning, and then you kind of like uh, brought it home with the cannabis later on. And it's like it's, uh, it would be nice if things were be, were completely seedless. And I just did a show recently on that that topic. But reality is that you, you're going to get husks and and stuff like that in most cases, unless you're doing what what I was talking to Steve about. So. Uh, yeah, but I mean, you know, I, I guess the, the, you know, in that case, they, in the diploid, they had like 300 and something seeds. And then in the, the triploid, they had like eight, right? Um, you know, if, if you're in an outdoor setting, I wouldn't expect 300 seeds in your crop or else you have a major problem, right? Usually the problem that I've seen in, in production facilities is that they have like, you know, a few seeds here and there. And so in that case, if you replace that with a triploid, you'll probably, maybe you'll see a seed once in a while, but you know, the reality is that you'll probably see none. And so... So yeah, whether you need it to be perfect or not, I don't know. Uh, you, you know, because the the trials when, when we're when we're doing things like that and what they did in that paper, that was in a pollination tent, right? Like they were they were, um, you know, pollinated much much more um, heavily than you would see in a natural problem with hermaphrodites or hemp or whatever. So because okay. you know, I think everyone knows cannabis pollen can travel very very far, but like you know, if you're if you're even half a kilometer away from a hemp field, you're only going to get a few seeds, right? It's pretty rare that your whole crop is just like full unless you missed a male or something like that but you know then you have other problems right yeah yeah you <laughs> yeah and it's your problem not the plant. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so uh, something that you brought up that uh this is kind of selfish of me right here but i was very fascinated with the uh the ratio of uh the naturally occurring uh polyploids is like it's it was it was interesting to me that uh, at the top of the list was the roots and tuber uh vegetables it's uh, plants i guess it's uh, classifying them that way is that like what we do with them so they uh, obviously everything has roots or tubers but it, anyway i was just uh fascinated with like did, did you see is there like you you've obviously studied this a lot not just in cannabis is a, do you have any like relationship of why there's some plants that are more uh, prone to doing this naturally as opposed to others? So that, that wasn't really a natural thing though. So in, in that case, when you're looking at roots and tubers, those are the domesticated ones. Right. And oh. so I, I, I think, you know, what's going on here is that, you know, I think tetraploidy, you know, some of the universal things it does is it tends to make like some of the vegetative organs like leaves and roots and things like that, like a, a storage root, would probably be a lot bigger in a tetraploid. So there's more incentive to select for tetraploids in a root crop, right? Whereas, you know, at the other end of the list was pulse crops. So that's like, um, you know, soybeans and um, lentils and things like that. And, you know, I, I, I guess there's just not that much incentive for, for tetraploids. And, you know, that might be a case where the, you know, they might have slower growth or delayed flowering, things like this that are just not compatible with pul growing pulse crops right and so i think in that case it's actually i don't think that's random by any means i think that's human selecting to you know for, for crops where polyploidy would be really beneficial like a root um i think we're selecting for that and then in other crops like like pulses where that would actually have a negative effect we're selecting against it and you know the, so the point of that is like where does cannabis fall in there i you know I, I, it depends i guess it depends on what you're growing it for too so you know if you were growing you know if we switch topics and go into like fiber hemp, for example, um, you know, the, the discussion could be very different. I don't know if tetraplasia would be good for that or bad for that, but um, it would be different, right? Got it. Uh, so thank you for clearing that up. Uh, people certainly aren't growing cannabis for roots. So that's... <laughs> well, some people are. So and, okay. uh, yeah, they, they use the roots for uh, medicine and, uh, you know, in the Caribbean and stuff, right? Oh, okay. That's so, just I don't think they're, hard, they're not cultivating it for the roots, but they're using the roots. Okay, gotcha. We, we have another good question here, and I think that this is related to which stock you started with. I'm not sure if that's true, Kara, but uh, that's the assumption that I'm making. Um, yeah, so those the, like the the tetraploids and stuff we were using in there, we, you know, unfortunately, and you know, I don't I don't want to get too into the weeds on this one, but uh, you know, in the Canadian system, we have a really hard time getting genetics, um, and so especially with you know we're, we operate 
um, under a research license. And so getting genetics is very difficult for us. That one in particular, um, it's a, it's, it's a Romulan cross. That's what I do know about it. Um, I think it was Romulan and Prozac cross or something. Um, so we, we don't have that much information on, um, what it is. It was a genetic that we, I was able to obtain. Um, I've since gotten a lot more and we, we, we have a huge flush of other tetraploids coming, um, of, you know, a variety of, of different genetics. So, um, that's what that one was. Um, and we've, we've made some crosses with some, you know, I've, 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 I've managed to import a bunch of genetics from Holland. So now I've made some crosses with some of those, um, things like that, but that's kind of early in the, in the pipeline. Awesome. Awesome. As a, we, we've gone over an hour now. I don't want to eat up a ton of your time. You gave us a great presentation. I, I really appreciate that. And I hope the audience does as well as I know that that, that takes time to put together and then you shared even more time with us and explaining it. So if there's anything more that you'd like to cover before we sign off here, and I'm sure Peter wants to promote the next show, I would imagine. So, yeah, there he is. <laughs> so is, is, is there anything more that you'd like to talk about before we sign out? Uh, no, I, I, I think that if that answers all the questions, I think that, that pretty much covers it. Um, again, thanks for uh, the invitation and uh, happy to speak. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful meeting you. I, I enjoyed it. I did Let's too. <laughs> I was laughing, but uh, yeah. Not, so, go ahead. I'm um, sorry. I, I, I guess the, the the one final thing I would say is that you know if anyone does have any questions um, that they didn't want to ask in, in public or anything, uh, feel free to email me. Um, I, I had my email on the first slide, so you can probably go back and uh, and and find that. Um, I'm happy to chat. Awesome. The, the openness is very refreshing, especially with like kind of new cutting edge. It's not really new, but it's cutting edge in cannabis for sure. So that's very refreshing, as I said. So I think he's going to go back and highlight that for us. There, there he is. University of Guelph. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> we practiced that many times before going live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that was awesome. And uh, I think it was an awesome day. Um, I need a nap. But uh, we have so we have the Dank Hour, which uh, I don't even know what channel we're on. Are we on channel one? Hey, I think we're on channel I one. Think one. So on channel yeah. two, we have the dank hour. We got an hour, 50 minutes for everybody to go. Uh, I don't know. Go see the sun, uh, eat some dinner, or I don't even know what time it is where people are. But uh, and then at so what is it? It's four o'clock Pacific time. So in two hours, so six o'clock Pacific, nine o'clock Eastern. Uh, we have Ryan Lee and uh, Trevor Whitkey jumping back on to kind of, I guess, reflect back on the day and probably talk about a whole bunch of other stuff. Then uh, at 8 p.m., if his internet connection is working, we got Mean Gene uh, jumping on with those guys uh, and uh, whoever else shows up for fcp after dark so awesome uh, max that was awesome uh my i didn't understand most of it but that's okay uh i i, I like think because i'd rather struggle than be like i already know all this stuff so and, and that's kind of the essence of what we we're trying to do today is is the rest of us trying to keep up with people who know a lot about whatever topic it is they're talking about uh, rather than your typical conference session where the first 20 to 30 minutes is stuff everybody already knows, but they're trying to bring the like two, you know, they're, they're talking to the lowest common denominator for the first 20, 30 minutes. And then just as it gets good, it's like, Oh, you know, we got to go, <laughs> we got to make room for the next session. So that was, we're trying to get away from that. And uh, I, I think we did. So, yeah, you, and, and my hope, my hope is guys like you, like enjoyed listening to other people talk today. And if that's the case, then we did it right. 
Yeah, I watched so, plenty of them. They were great. Yeah, so we'll we'll do it again, uh, hopefully on a different different topic next month, and then we'll come back to kind of this stuff. But Max, we'd love to have you come back on again anytime and uh, pair you with some other smart people. Maybe you and Osama could could uh, talk shop because I was just I was listening to him and I was like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so anyway with that you can uh i guess right. end the broadcast and there's right. anna <laughs> she'll be on hopefully and uh uh sorry the not not the topic but i think anna's gonna be on uh at five o'clock or no yeah five o'clock pacific time dank hour channel two and I like what the light did to your camera here. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was just <laughs> noticing that. I was like, that is trippy. Yeah, yeah. the sun's setting. I, so I need nice, that lens nice. on my uh, on my camera. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks for your time, Max. Thanks for doing today, Peter. It was awesome. I uh, hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Bye, everyone. I did. <laughs>